Hi. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Atal Cohomology. So today we're going to talk about one of my literally favorite topics in all of math, which is Broward groups. Um, but uh, before that, are there any questions about what we've been talking about so far? All right, well, if not, um, let me uh, remind you where we are. So here's a reminder. So, so our current goal is to prove the following. So C is a smooth curve over an algebraic closed field. And uh, we're trying to compute the atoll homology of C with coefficients in GM. And we've already computed it in degree uh, zero, in which case it's uh, just OC cross of C. So that's in degree zero. And we've computed in degree one, in which case it was pick C. So that followed from uh, what we called Hilbert's theorem 90, uh, which was a special case of faithfully flat descent. And then uh, the goal is to show that it vanishes in degree bigger than one. So we've, we've done this, we've done this. And uh, so far, degree zero is, uh, sorry, degree bigger, sorry, this should be bigger than one, not bigger than zero. Uh, so far, all higher degrees are a total mystery. Um, and so, so today, uh, what we're trying to understand is the number after one, which is we're trying to understand i equals two. And in fact, we've, we've reduced this to some question about, purely about Galois of cohomology. So we've reduced this to understanding. So this is what we did it last time, uh, hi of the function field of C with GM coefficients. And also, HI of the strictly Henselian local rings at closed points of C. So this is the, the strict Henselization. And let me just remind you that was the stock of the structure sheep of C. Of uh, OCX. All right. Are there any questions about this? So, so today we're going to try to understand basically the Galois cohomology of a field with coefficients in k bar star, part k bar cross, or, or GM if you'd like it, to think about it as, as a sheep on the Atoll site. Um, and uh, we're really basically going to be discussing i equals 2, but it will turn out, and this is kind of a general principle in group cohomology, that if you can understand i equals 1 and i equals 2, um, so then you can understand cohomology in all degrees. Um, that's, that's not always true, but it's often true in, in group cohomology and, and Galois cohomology is a special case of uh, group cohomology. So are there any questions about this? So this is, I claim this is stuff we've already done, um, modulo this question mark here and, and modulo understanding what these groups actually are. Um, but uh, does anyone want me to remind them a little bit about why this is what we're interested in? All right, good. So you guys are all on, on top of things. Um, so, so maybe just a reminder or just a comment, like in, in general, H1 is not that hard to understand. Like that's something, eight classes saying H1 have a geometric meaning and we talked about that geometric meaning. They classify torsors. And, and often you can think of torsors as real like physical objects or at least insofar as any scheme or sheaf is a physical object. So H2 is much harder. There is some abstract sense in which it classifies a, a real object. So, so elements of H2 correspond to certain stacks called gerbs. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but the real miracle is that, that H2 of GM has real meaning. So it, 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 it's very closely related to the Brouwer group. And elements of the Brouwer group, as we'll see today, are at least closely related to real physical objects, so certain torsors. OK, so let me remind you. So we defined if x is a scheme, we defined the cohomological Brouwer group of X. And some people just call this Burr prime, so Brouwer prime of X. This was defined to be, you take the atoll cohomology of X with coefficients in GM, and then you take the torsion there. Okay, and at the end of last time, we started defining the Brouwer group. So we said, we can look at the image over, the union over all N, of the set of PGLN torsors over X. 
So let's say it's all locally trivial. Trivial PGLN torsors over X. And I claimed that there was a map to H2 Exital GM. And we started working out that map last time, but we didn't quite finish giving an explicit description of it. But uh, we, we made the following definition, the, the Brouwer group of X, and right now all we know it's, is that it's a set, is the image of this map. So the Brouwer group, which we don't know is a group yet even, uh, is, is going to be defined as the image of this map, which is, at least I hope you agree with me, the, the source of this map, the, the set of PGLM torses, is a reasonably explicit geometric object. Okay, are there any, any questions about this? Okay, so can anyone remind me how, how we define this map from atoll locally trivial PGLM torses over X to the atoll cohomology of GM in degree two? We use the GM to GLN to PGLN. Yeah, so so this map delta here, or I'll, I'll call it delta, and the reason why is that as, as Arvin suggests, uh, let me move delta a little bit over, as Arvin suggests, this is coming from some kind of long exact sequence in cohomology, and the weird thing is that it's coming from a long exact sequence, a, a short exact sequence of sheaves, where not all the sheaves showing up are, are abelian. So, so, okay, so what is the, what is the, definition of delta. So it's the boundary map. And I'll say what this means a little bit more explicitly. From H1, xatol, pgln, or really the union over all n, this thing, to H2 of xatol, gm, arising from the long set sequence, arising from the, the so-called long set sequence, I'll say what I mean by it, by it, associated to the short exact sequence of sheaves, one to GM, to GLN, to PGLN, to one. So this is a short exact sequence of sheaves of groups on X A tall. Okay, and we even, at the very end of last time, we even argued, uh, so, so exactness, uh, at left exactness is not so hard to see, and at the last time, end of last time, we act, argued that this was actually even exact in the Zariski topology. And that was because this map GLN to PGLN is a GM torsor, and so it's Zariski locally trivial. Okay, uh, are there any questions about this? And then we had a lot of discussion about what the sheaf PGLN actually looks like explicitly. Okay, so, so let's talk about what this boundary map means. So, so hopefully um, this is all film, film, this is familiar to you when, when you've seen, uh, in, in the case of a, a short exact sequence of abelian sheaves, and I don't at all expect this is familiar uh, in the case of, of uh, non-abelian sheaves of groups. Um, so, so let me maybe make a, a remark. So, so as far as I know, the best reference for this, and maybe someone else can suggest another reference, is uh, Verdier's book, or sorry, Giraud's book. So, Giraud's book, uh, Comology Non Abelian. Um, so, this is something that um, I would say uh, you, you can find in a bunch of places this sort of long, long exact sequence or sort of partial long exact sequence associated to a short exact sequence of, of possibly uh, non-abelian uh, group, uh, sheaves of groups. Um, but uh, it was originally developed in this book by Giro, and I, I don't know a better reference. So if, if anyone else here does, you should feel free to put it in the chat um, or, or just unmute yourself and let me know. Um, it's, it's actually a surprisingly useful thing. Um, so for example, Juan Lin, who's, who's here today, um, and I are, are currently writing a paper, which will hopefully be done very soon, where we use uh, a some kind of long set sequence in non-abelian group cohomology, um, but it's also a little bit complicated. Okay, so I'm not going to give you all the details of of what the 
how, how you make a sort of partial long Zeph sequence from a, from a short exact sequence, what I will do is I'll remark it's a little bit subtle. So, so what you get is a, a, long, a long exact sequence of sets. Of sets, which terminates at, uh, at what we're interested in, H2GM. And that itself is even special. So, so you usually don't even get a boundary map from the H1 of, of PGLN or H1 of this thing on the right uh, to H2 of the thing on the left. You need more than this, that this is a billion. You need it that it's actually in the center, which is true in our, in our situation. Okay, so, so let's try to make this explicit. So let's make delta explicit in terms of check cohomology. Okay, and maybe let me remind you, that's in fact the only way we have to make sense of this set here, right? We actually define this set to be the set of etal locally trivial PGLN torsors. And we said that, well, that has a sort of description in terms of check H1, like the, the, the boundary map in check homology doesn't make sense usually for a non-abelian group, but in very low degree, like degree one, it does. Okay, so can anyone tell me how, how you would try to do that? So how would you make this um, how would you make this boundary map explicit in terms of check homology? So how, basically, what I'm asking you to do is is implement the snake lemma, right? That's where the boundary map in in a, in a, in a long set sequence comes from. So can anyone tell me? So let's start with so what we do, let's start with t, an element of H one. X A tall PGLN. So T is a PGLN torsor. And it's split by some cover U to X, right? And that's because it's a it's a, a locally trivial PGLN torsor. All right, so what now? On the intersections, it has to be given by isomorphisms of projective space, which are like PGLs. Yeah, yeah. So, so okay. So there's an implicit lemma here that Ben is using. Well, also, first of all, um, there's no projective space here, right? So, so we'll, we'll, we'll relate it to projective space in a minute. But yeah, so, so what you're right is that on the order, on the intersections, so on U cross U over X, the descent data is given by some section gamma in u cross u over x with with uh, with uh, some some section to the sheaf pgl on, on this well why is that so this is something we've discussed a couple times now it's just that what is descent data it's an isomorphism uh, on this double intersection and automorphisms of PGLN as a PGLN torsor are the same as sections to PGLN. Okay, so what now? So this, this descent data satisfies the co-cycle condition. That'll be key in a little bit. I mean, all descent data satisfies the co-cycle condition, but I wanna make it explicit. Okay, so what now? So now we have an, an element of the check complex. So how do we apply the boundary map to it? Can anyone tell me? So how do you how do you do a boundary map? So you, you when you make the snake lemma, you do some little zigzag, right? So what's the next step? Okay. Well, what we do is that um, we maybe have to refine you. We can lift this descent data. to a section, and I'm just gonna use the same U, of GLN. Can anyone tell me why this is possible?
because it's surjective, right? Yeah, so this is a surjection of schemes. So, so okay, there's a little subtlety in, in why you can refine u rather than u cross u. And in fact, if you want to work in complete generally, generality, you should refine u cross u, but I'm going to ignore that issue for now. Okay, so, so we've now lifted this descent data to a section of GLN. So how are we going to make a, um, an, a, an element of H2 of GM from that? So H2 of GM is, is represented by a section to GM over U cross U cross U, right? So you, you want descent data for GLN, but you don't quite have it because it might not satisfy this co-cycle data condition on the nose. It might differ by a co-cycle of, of constant, of, of, of functions, right? Like PGL That's exactly over right. GLN. That's exactly right. So we started with something which satisfies the cosecyclic condition, and we just lifted it in an arbitrary way. So there's no reason for it to satisfy the cosecyclic condition. So let's write out what that says. So let's take the pullbacks. Um, so so pi one two pullback of s, um, pi two three pullback of s, and we can multiply them. Um, so pi one two pi two three. So normally we'd want that to equal pi one three. So we can measure this, but it's failure to be that by, by taking pi 1, 3s inverse. Okay? And this, the claim is that this is a section to u cross u cross u with coefficients in GM. Well, why is that? A priori, it's just something, a section to GLN, but we know that this is one when you map to PGLN. So that means that it has to come from GM. Okay, and this is a two co-cycle, this is the claim at least, uh, representing an element of um, H2 x et al GM. Okay, and there's a couple things to check there. Uh, the main one is that you have to check it actually satisfies the, the co-cycle, that D of it is zero. Um, and that's something that, that I'll leave you as an exercise. All right, are there any questions about this? Okay, so this is the map explicitly. So, so what I would say is it's, the, what, what, we've, what we've done actually is we've proven the, the following kind of slogan, which is that delta of this torsor T is the obstruction To lifting T to a, a GLN torsor. Okay, and that's sort of what you would expect. Like the, the image of something under a boundary map should be the obstruction to lift to it coming from the, the previous thing. Right. So so what we're saying is this this class, this is called the Brower class of T. is the obstruction to doing that. Okay, so let's, um, let's talk about this. So, okay, so, so far we now have defined this map. We still uh, don't know that it's, its image is a group. So its image, right now we've just mapped from some set to a group and there's no reason why the image of such a map should be a group. And we also don't know uh, yet that it actually lies inside of this cohomological power group because we don't know uh, that, that the image is torsion. All right. So in order to prove that, we're going to have to do some geometry. Um, so, so what I want to discuss now is, is kind of geometric interpretations of Brouwer classes, so of, of both PGLN torsors and Brouwer classes. OK, so before I do that, are there any questions? So right. just to clarify, so by delta of t obstruction, you mean um, that may be a non-trivial? Um, yeah, so I mean uh, that being non-zero is the obstruction to lifting your PGLN torsor to a GLN torsor. Does, the, does that answer your question, Arvin? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah. so in particular, if it is zero, you can't you can lift. Great. Um, yeah, and this is, by the way, this is sort of a general principle, so sometimes uh, you know, people will do similar things with, instead of 
uh, instead of like uh, GLN mapping to PGLN, you might do like uh, 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 like um, o, of, o of a quadratic form Q mapping to P O of Q. Um, and uh, uh, um, yeah, so, so there, this is sort of a general th principle that sometimes you can make kind of abelian cohomology classes as obstructions to lifting non-abelian torsors from one group to another. Uh, great. Okay, um, so let's, uh, let's talk about this. So, so um, here's, first of all, a general principle. And we've talked about this a little bit, but I wanna kind of remind you So, so suppose um, T uh, is, a, is an object just in sheaves of sets on X et al. And again, this will work on any site. And uh, G is the sheaf, which is aught of T. So sections of this are, are um, over, over an open, or you pull back T to the open, and then you compute aught of it. Um, so for example, T can be a scheme. And in, 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 in all of our examples, we'll just think that think that T is a scheme. All right. So the general principle is that there's a natural bijection between locally split uh, G torsors and forms of uh, T. So, so we've talked about this before. So for example, when we talked about uh, GLN torsors being the same as vector bundles, this is an example of this. So in this case, we would take T to be the trivial vector bundle um, and, and uh, G is GLN. Okay, so what do I mean by form? So by a form of T, I mean a, a sheaf on X. Uh, locally. Isomorphic to T. So, for example, a vector bundle is locally isomorphic to a trivial vector bundle. Um, so, so this this correspondence between G torsors and forms, when you apply it to GLN and the trivial vector bundle, says that GLN torsors are the same as 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 vector bundles. All right. So, can anyone tell me how to make this bijection? So, how do you go from right to left, for example? So how do you go from a form of T to a, a G torso? Take the sheaf of automorphisms. Or maybe the sheaf of isomorphisms. Sorry, that's what I meant, yeah. Yeah, yeah so starting with the form F, um, we, can, we can take isom, the isom sheaf from um, F to T. This is if you want, uh, I guess I, I've been vague about whether I want right or left torsors. So this is if you want a right torsor, otherwise you would do isom T F. Okay, why is this locally, locally split? Well, because F is locally trivial. It's locally isomorphic to T. So if you base change to some cover where, uh, where F is actually trivial, then, then this torsor will be split. All right, what, what about how do you go from a, a torsor? Uh, unfortunately, I've, I've used T for my object. Uh, what's a good, let me call it tau is a torsor. So how do you go from a torsor to a form? Can anyone tell me? I think I've heard you say this before. You take, you take the product of tau with the trivial torsor. Yeah, so you take tau times uh, t, the thing we're taking the forms of, and then you take the diagonal quotient by g. So this is the, the sheaf quotient. But in good cases, this quotient will actually be representable by, by a, a scheme. And, and that usually won't be so hard to see because G here acts, acts simply transitively on this torsor. So basically all this quotient is doing is getting rid of this tau part and making the fibers isomorphic to T instead. Okay, so, so here's some examples. I've already uh, discussed this a couple times. So GLN torsors are the same uh, as vector bundles. Okay, maybe it's worth mentioning. I mean, there's a reason I'm writing these these arrows going both ways, rather than saying it's an equivalence of categories. 
And it's because it's not an equivalence of categories. So there are maps between vector bundles which don't come from maps of torsors. For example, any map which is not an isomorphism uh, will not come from a map of torsors. So what, what this really means is that, um, what I, I mean by this double arrow, if you would like a, a rigorous statement, is that there's a bijection between the two sets of GLN torsors up to isomorphism and vector bundles up to isomorphism. Okay. All right, so now, now let's get, um, let's get uh, to talking about the situation with PGLN. Um, so, so let's do PGLN. So now let's talk about G is PGLN. So what we're doing is we're looking for objects with, with automorphism group PGLN. So what are some objects with automorphism group isomorphic as a sheaf to PGLN. So can anyone give me some examples? So what's your favorite thing with automorphism group PGLN? So this I know you know, in fact, someone said it uh, a few minutes ago. Projective n space. Yeah, that's well, maybe projective n minus one space. N minus one, yeah. yeah. So example, so ought over x of p n minus one x is pgln. Okay, maybe it's worth remarking. So you've probably all done this over an algebraic closed field. It's true over a general base, and it's not totally trivial. So, so uh, when I write x, I actually mean exercise. So you should prove this. And it's not trivial, uh, so I think you'll probably need to use something like the theorem on formal functions at some point, um, or, or formal gal or whatever, whatever form of that you would like to use. Um, so, so what this tells us is that there's a natural bijection between PGLN torsors up to isomorphism and forms of PN. Okay, and, and these have a name. These are called severi brower schemes. Or severi brower X schemes. And if X is a point, if X is spec K, you usually say they're severi brower varieties. I think you mean forms of PN minus one. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Great. Um, can anyone give me another example of a object with automorphism group PGLN? PSAs. I'm sorry. Central simple algebras. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so a central simple algebra in general won't quite have automorphism group P PN. Um, uh, yeah. But what, what is true is that a matrix algebra will, right? So example, uh, the algebra of n by n matrices over a ring. So all of this is PGLN. And, uh, and this, is, this is called the Skolem Nerder theorem. Or maybe Nerder, I don't know why I put Skolem first, but I think that's how it's usually written. But maybe I'll put it in alphabetical order. Nerder Skolem theorem. So what that tells us is that there's a bijection between PGLN torsors and forms of uh, mat n by n. So here, if you'd like, you can think of this as as end of the trivial vector bundle. Okay, and forms of this algebra have a name. They're called Azumai algebras. Okay, and and um, our over field, those are central simple algebras. So, so um, there's a fact, which we'll maybe even see in a little bit, depending on how much time we have, that that's just things over a field are always uh, matrix algebras over a division algebra. All right, um, great. So, so let me remark, I mean, okay, in principle, we've given a recipe, we can take, go from a form of PN to a PGLN torsor, 
and then from that PGLN torsor to, a, to an SMI algebra. But it's not actually so obvious how to go directly from the severi brower to the SMI algebra and, and, and back. And so, so I want to discuss a way to do that, and it's a way that I really like to think about uh, Brouwer classes and, and forms of PGLN and so on and so forth. But before I do that, um, are, there any, are there any questions? Is it frozen for anyone else? Can you, uh, is, when you say it, do you mean me? It doesn't seem frozen. Can you, uh, yeah, he can scroll up and down on my screen. Arvin, can you see it now? Oh, no, it's good. Sorry, I think it's, it was my, my fault. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so, so are there any other questions about um, these sorts of, these sorts of, so the key takeaway here is that, okay, the Brouwer, well, right now we just know it's a set, the Brouwer group, which we'll prove it as a group in a little bit, Objects of it have, have representatives which are very concrete. So, namely, forms of PN minus one. So you can think those are like a tall locally trivial PN minus one bundles, um, or forms of a matrix algebra. So those are like quasi coherent sheaves of algebras, or sorry, coherent sheaves of algebras, which a tall locally look like endomorphisms of the trivial bundle. Okay. Um, are there any questions about those? All right, so, so this, is, um, this is how people usually think about Brouwer groups. They think about it as, in terms of the, one of these two objects, so Azumai algebras or PGLN torsors. I want to give you a third way, uh, which I think is really cool, um, and I'm going to kind of sketch how to prove things in terms of these objects called twisted sheaves. Okay, so we've actually already basically said what a twisted sheaf is. So let me scroll up over here. And, and show you what we did when we defined this boundary map. So, so when we defined this boundary map, what we did is we said we had some descent data for PGLN, so that was on double intersections, some, some elements of PGLN, and we lifted those to elements of GLN. Okay, so, so here's another way of interpreting what we did. So definition, so I'm gonna let alpha, so let um, u to x be an atoll cover, And alpha, an element of the check complex on the triple intersection of u over x with GM coefficients. Oh boy, there's someone uh, doing uh, leaf blowing literally right outside my window. Is that, uh, is, can you guys hear that? Is it uh, making it, making what I'm saying incomprehensible? It's fine, I think. Okay, good. All right, so, so suppose I have an atoll cover and some alpha in here. And suppose alpha represents, so suppose it's an honest code, two code cycles. So suppose it represents some class alpha in H2 x at all GM. So I want to tell you what an alpha twisted sheaf is. So an alpha twisted sheaf, and note here I'm, I'm honestly twisting by the code cycle, not by the Brouwer class is a sheaf on U. So by a sheaf, I mean a, a, a quasi-coherent sheaf on U. An isomorphism, let's call it phi, from let's call it a sheaf, uh, maybe a sheaf F on U. So an isomorphism between the two pullbacks of F to U cross U. So this looks like descent data, except we don't want it to be descent data. What we want is that it satisfies the co-cycle condition up to alpha. So, so what does that mean? It means that um, pi 2, 3 pullback of phi composed with pi 1, 2 pullback of phi is alpha times uh, pi 1, 3 pullback of phi. Okay, so if alpha was just the constant function 1, this would be an honest, uh, an honest sheaf. It would be descent data for a quasi-coherent sheaf, but alpha is not necessarily 1. So here we're, we're twisting what it means to be a sheaf. Are there any questions about this definition?
No? Good. Okay, so so uh, let, let's, can anyone tell me how one of these might show up naturally? We've actually already seen some. Is this like a PGL torsor? Yeah, so, so this is exactly what we did when we were defining this boundary map. So what do we do? We start with a PGL torsor, lift to a GL torsor. So maybe we can't do that on you, but you can actually always lift to a, uh, uh, because our, our torsor is split on you, um, you can always lift to a, a quasi-coherent sheaf on, on you. And then we got some isomorphisms between the, those sheaves, those, these GL torsors, on the, uh, on, the, on the double overlaps. Okay, and those isomorphisms fail to satisfy the co-cycle condition. And in general, the two co-cycle that measures that failure was exactly a Brouwer class. So when we defined this boundary map delta, our intermediate step was precisely an alpha twisted sheaf. All right. So, so we now know at least what the object of the category of alpha twisted sheaves are. So I'm going to define a category. So this is called QCO X alpha. And the objects are alpha twisted sheaves. And the morphisms are the obvious thing. So the morphisms are morphisms of sheaves on you. On you commuting with this pseudo descent data, data fee. Okay, so this is some cool category, uh, just as an example. If you take uh, the constant co-cycle one, uh, so so this implicitly in this definition is is uh, a cover U, uh, but but I'm I'm considering that as part of the data of alpha. So so if you take um, Q co x comma one, so where with any cover, this is going to be canonically isomorphic to Q co x. Can anyone tell me why? So this is this is the name of this theorem is is uh, it has a very famous name. We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. Descent. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a tall descent. Great. Okay. So so this is a category. Uh, it's a pretty cool category. Um, let me, uh, let me tell you some facts about it. I'm not going to prove all of them, but I'll, I'll prove a couple. So here's a, a proposition. So suppose that alpha and alpha prime are two co-cycles for GM. So the kind of things that lets us define, uh, let, let us define a twisted sheaf. So one, um, Alpha being a Brouwer class, so meaning the, the co cycle represented by alpha, suppose it lives in Brouwer of X, meaning it's in the image of this boundary map from PGLN. So this is the same as uh, there existing an alpha twisted sheaf. And in fact, we proved that already, right? What we, being, being, in the, being in the Brouwer means you're in the image of delta. But part of our construction of delta was to construct a, 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 a alpha twisted sheep from a PGL on torsor. All right. Two. Uh, so this category, QCO X alpha, is an abelian category. That's actually easy. Um, and then the hard part is that it has enough injectives. And this is if, if X is nice. And let me not dwell on what that means. Um, all right. Sorry. You, I'm sorry? You said we constructed a twisted sheaf, right? And that, that's the one that we get by quotienting out, like taking the product and quotienting out. No, no, no. So that was the torsor associated to a, that was the, the, sorry, the twisted form associated to a torsor. So when we constructed, we constructed a twisted sheaf, 
uh, up here, when we started with a torsor, we got some two cycle, two, some co-cycle with values in PGLN, and we lifted it to a co-cycle with values in GLN. Okay, cool. Right, and then and then that that co-cycle didn't quite satisfy the co-cycle condition, and that's exactly what it means to be a twisted sheaf. Yeah, this is kind of a funky way of, of thinking about things, but I really like it because you can really think of twisted sheaves as just being like almost like sheaves. Like they're, they're very familiar objects. Okay, so, so now there's a, there's a tensor functor from QCO X alpha times QCO X alpha prime. And where does it land? It lands in QCO x alpha times alpha prime. OK, there's a little subtlety here if alpha and alpha prime are defined on different covers. You have to pass to a, a common refinement and work there. But I'll, I'll let you think about this. There's also a hum functor from QCO x alpha times QCO x alpha prime to uh, QCO uh, x alpha prime minus alpha. Okay, and how do you make this functor? You literally just tensor your, your sheaves on u together or palm your sheaves together and, and use the induced pseudo descent data. Okay, similarly, there's, there's functors sim n, for example, and wedge n, which go from uh, qco x alpha to qco x alpha prime, uh, oh, sorry, x n alpha. Sorry, I lied by the way. I shouldn't, uh, I, up here I shouldn't have said twisted sheaf. I sh should have said twisted vector bundle. Very sorry about that. That just means the sheaf on you is a vector bundle. Okay, and finally, um, uh, and I already said this, QCO x one is, uh, is canonically equivalent to QCO x. All right, uh, so let's let's talk through some of these things. I'm not gonna. I'm I'm especially not gonna give a proof of two. Not it's not hard. It's just involved. Um, so so one we already talked about. So suppose alpha is in Brower over x. That means that there's a PGLN torsor uh, whose whose boundary is alpha. Okay, and then we already constructed an alpha twisted vector bundle uh, out of it. That that was precisely our construction of delta. Can anyone tell me how to go the other way? So suppose I'm given an alpha twisted vector bundle. How do I get a Brouwer class? Anyone? Well, one thing you could do is you could try to construct a, a, a twisted form of PN. So how would you do that from a, a twisted vector bundle? You take proj? Yeah, you can take, uh, you can just projectivize it. So you have a vector bundle on you. It's projectivization is a, is a PN bundle on you. And now your descent data, which your pseudo descent data, which used to not be descent data, is actually descent data. Because when you mod out, when you make something, when you projectivize, you mod out by scalars. And the failure to be descent data was exactly scalars. All right, um, so this tensor and hum, you just have to work out what happens to alpha and alpha prime when you tensor your twisted sheaves together or hum them together, same with sim n and wedge n. Um, so in fact, everything except for two is, is more or less directly from the definition. So, so proof is, is to actually, let me, let me just leave as an exercise, try to prove three and four. Okay. So, so there's an immediate corollary, which is that Brouwer of X is a group. Can anyone give me the proof? Oh, so Arvind asks, can you give an explicit example of an alpha? Is it right to think that it's something that becomes trivial after any tall base change? So alpha is, is uh, it's not usually gonna be trivial. It's, alpha is gonna be like an invertible function on u cross u cross u. But what is true is that, that locally, it'll be the boundary of something, right? So that's, that's um, 
that's that's sort of true of cohomology in general. If you're on a nice enough scheme, so for example, quasi-projective variety, any class with cohomology in any abelian sheaf in degree bigger than one is locally at the boundary of something. All right. So, okay, can anyone prove to me using this proposition that the Brouwer group is a group? So remember, all we defined it as was uh, some set. It was the image of some, some boundary map uh, from a set. We'll see the second group operation would be tensor product. Uh, yeah, so, so what does it mean? So suppose we have alpha and alpha prime. So then, so those are, those are, we can think of those as, so we can let E be an alpha twisted vector bundle. Mm -hmm. So that exists by this one. We can let E prime be an alpha prime twisted vector bundle. And we want to show that alpha times alpha prime is, is a Brouwer class, meaning uh, it, there exists an alpha alpha prime twisted vector bundle. And well, as Sasha said, E tensor E prime is an alpha alpha prime twisted vector bundle. And having a twisted vector bundle, we said was the same as being a Brouwer class. All right, so what about inversion? So how do we show that the inverse of a, of a Brouwer class is a Brouwer class? And Arvind, don't, don't worry. I see Arvind in the chat is asking about explicit examples. I'll, I'll discuss a couple explicit examples of, of these objects in a minute. All right, so how do we do inversion? My hint is that there's a minus sign appearing here. Mm -hmm. So, so in other words, we want. So this is this is the this gives us the product. Okay, now we want suppose alpha is a Brouwer class, and here E is an alpha twisted vector bundle. We want. an alpha inverse twisted vector bundle. Okay, and and can anyone make one? The, the dual effect? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and that's 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 an alpha inverse twisted vector bundle. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, well, I wrote this minus, I wrote it additively here. Let me, let me write it multiplicatively, which I've been doing everywhere else. All right, so we've now proven the Brouwer group as a group. Great. Um, I just want to prove a couple more basic facts about the Brouwer group, and then I'll give some examples. So here's a sort of proposition. So suppose uh, alpha is a is a two cycle for GM. Then alpha is trivial if and only if there exists an alpha twisted line bundle. Can anyone prove this for me? So, so let's let's do the the first direction. So suppose E is an alpha twisted line bundle. How do we how do we show that alpha is trivial? Well, maybe the easier direction is is this way. So suppose alpha is trivial. Can anyone make for me an alpha twisted line bundle? What would the uh, OX be a line yeah. bundle? So OX is. So there's an implicit, implicit lemma here which is that uh, if alpha is isomorphic to alpha prime, sorry, meaning, meaning the Brouwer classes are the same, then QCO X alpha is equivalent to QCO X alpha prime. And I, I've, I've carefully wrote this is equivalent without an arrow here because it's actually not a canonical equivalence. But so, so you should prove this lemma. It's, it's easy in fact, but, but um, it, it's an exercise worth doing. Um, okay, but once you have this, well, if alpha is trivial, then then that means that the class of alpha is the same as the class of one, which means that this category is abstractly equivalent to the category of uh, quasi cohesion shifts on X, and then OX is a is an honest line bundle. All right, 
What about the other direction? So suppose I have an alpha twisted line bundle. So let me remind you, how do you write down a line bundle? Well, you take a cover, you take the trivial bundle on each cover, and then on double intersections, you have, you have gluing data, which is a, a section of GM on the double intersections. So how would you use such a thing to prove that, uh, that alpha is, is, uh, is a trivial Brouwer class, so trivial on H2 of GM? Well, so you have like a, for, for n equals one in the exact sequence, it's just like GM goes to trivial goes to GM. So you would expect that the boundary map of a line bundle is always zero in the prior. Yeah, the, that's the actually boundary. totally, that's a, a perfectly good proof. Let me be a little bit more explicit about what you just said. So, so here are the descent data for L. All that means is the gluing data I just described is the same as a global section to GM on U cross U for some U. Okay, and then uh, some, so let me call it beta. And then the claim is that the check differential applied to beta is just alpha. Okay, and that's what it means for alpha to be zero in H2 of GM. Okay, and, and finally, let me prove a cool corollary. So suppose E is an alpha twisted vector bundle. Of rank N. Then the class of alpha in H2 X et al. GM is N torsion. So we just proved this when n is one. So can anyone tell me how to deduce the uh, the general statement? So how do you make a line bundle out of a out of a vector bundle? Dominant or something? Yeah, yeah. Take the top wedge power. So wedge n of E, which we said is something we could do to twisted sheaves, is n. And we said that this, uh, if, you, if we scroll up to this proposition from before, we said that wedge n multiplies the, the Bauer class by n, or takes it to the nth power in, in multiplicative notation. So what that tells us is that this is a n alpha, or maybe I'll write it as in multiplicative notation, alpha to the n twisted line bundle. OK, and by the previous proposition, this implies that alpha to the n, which is alpha to the n, is uh, trivial. Cool. OK, so we've now proved that the Brouwer group is a group, and we've moreover proven its torsion. So, so corollary. Brower of X is a subset of Brower prime of X, which remember was the torsion in the Atel homology of X with coefficients in GM. Great. All right, let me let me give you some examples because this has gotten very abstract. Abstract. So can anyone give me uh, so so uh, let's just talk about some examples of Brower classes. So can anyone give me some examples of, of let's say, Azumai algebras or twisted forms of PN or whatever you'd like? So what's your favorite twisted form of P1? Rarasavari phrase? Which, which one? You have to give me an Oh, OK. like x squared plus y squared plus c squared. No, actually that has a solution. Well, over which field? Um, and what, what does it equal? R, I guess, would be good. Yeah, so if we set x squared plus y squared plus c squared equals 0 over the real numbers, so this is a conic with no rational points. 
So a smooth conic over no rational points. And we know uh, this is, uh, what's it called? It's uh, a stereographic progression, projection, I think it's called, that if you have a conic with a rational point, a smooth projective conic with a rational point, it's isomorphic to P1. So this is something that becomes isomorphic to P1 when you base change to C, where you have a rational point. So, so this, uh, so let's call this X. So XC we know is isomorphic to P1. And this implies that X is a twisted form of P1R. Okay, and in fact, um, the, the class of X, so if you take delta of this X, it uh, generates the power group of R, which is um, Z mod two. Can anyone tell me uh, what is the generator of this Brouwer group uh, if, if we want an Azumai algebra or also known as a central simple algebra since we're a first field uh, rather than a Severi Brouwer? Is it the quaternions? Yeah, the Hamilton quaternions. Um, are a, uh, they're a division algebra in fact. Hence, or uh, central division algebra, hence an Azumai algebra. Uh, generate, uh, representing the same element. Is there a map directly from the Azumai algebras to the twisted forms of P and? Or That's a good question. Yeah, so let me say how I think about it. So I think of, of both of them coming from twisted sheaves. So let's actually write out the diagram. So given an alpha twisted sheaf, E, one thing you can do is you can take the projectivization of it. So this gives you a Severi Brower. And the, there's a, a little subtlety here. So let me say what's happening. So an alpha twisted sheaf is a vector bundle with twisted descent data. When you projectivize that twisted descent data becomes honest descent data because it was twisted by a scalar and projectivization kills scalars. All right, but there's a little bit of subtlety, which is that descent data is not effective for schemes, right? So to actually say there's an honest variety rather than just like a sheaf representing this descent, um, you need a little bit of extra, extra argument. And the argument is that projective space is anti-canonically polarized. So I think I remarked on this, but we didn't prove it which is that if you have descent data for a polarized variety, meaning a variety plus an ample line model on it, then it's effective. And any descent data on projective space is automatically polarized because there's kind of a, a canonical polarization, namely the dual of the canonical sheaf. All right, now let's also say how to get an Azumai algebra. Well, we just take ND, and this is an Azumai algebra. So t taking n kills the it kills the 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 twisting co-cycle. So we get honest descent data. So we get an honest sheaf of algebras. And why is it locally isomorphic to a matrix algebra? Well, it's because if you pass to a a cover of of U where E itself is trivialized, then it's then it's a matrix algebra. So so that's how I think about it. So I, I think of the the map between these two things as kind of passing through twisted sheaves. Does that answer your question, Ben? Yeah, I'm just wondering if you can show how the quaternions are end of the scheme over R in some sense. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're not end of the scheme over R, so... so the, the twisted sheaf associated to this. Yeah, so, so you could do that directly. Um, it, I, I don't think it would actually be super hard, um, but uh, I'm not going to try to do it right now because I'll definitely screw up. Maybe I will remark, so there is a direct way to go from Azumai algebras to Severi Browers. So these are, these are moduli the, the Severi Brower associated to a, a, an Esmai is the moduli of certain ideals in the Esmai. But I, I'd have to think a little bit about what the right formulation is. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't know a, a slick way of going the other way from the Severi Brower to the Esmai. Um, are, are there any questions about that? Yeah, that's a great question. All right, so I, I did want to give a couple more examples of Brower classes because this is like a, a beautiful thing. So did, does anyone know any other examples? Hmm. 
I saw Ben briefly unmute. Did you have an idea? Well, I was going to say like all the ones in class field theory, but then I realized I couldn't actually write any of them down. That's all right. Yeah. So, so it's pretty hard to write them down in general. Let me, let me kind of, actually, I wanted to give, give kind of, of class field theory as an example. So, so the Brouwer group of, of QP, does anyone know what it is? Or QP is the, the piatic field? Q mod Z. Yeah. So it's Q mod Z. And in principle, you can write down, write them, write down um, honest representatives of all these classes. So it's it's done, I think, in in Castle's full like it's algebraic number theory book, for example. I'm not going to try to do it, but maybe maybe the remark is that over a field, uh, any two torsion Bauer class. is represented by a quaternion algebra. So, so what I mean by that is you take the formula for the Hamilton quaternions, which says that something is squared to minus one, and you change those minus ones to some other numbers. So, so in general, for the unique two torsion element of this Q mod Z, so that's like one half, uh, mod, mod, the co-cycle of, the, the co-set of Z corresponding to one half, um, that's represented by a very explicit uh, uh, quaternion algebra, which looks very much like the Hamilton quaternions. All right. Uh, so we already said what what um, we already said what uh, what R what the Brouwer group of R looks like. We can also say what the Brouwer group of Q looks like. So there's a map from the Brouwer group of Q. Well, given a given a an as my algebra or, or it's very Brouwer, for example, for Q. You can restrict it, you can pull it back to QP, right? Or to R. So there's a map to the direct sum over all the places of Q, including infinity, so including R, to the Brouwer group of, of the completion of Q at that place. So for all finite places, we just learned this is Q mod Z for R of Z mod two. Uh, the map is to the direct sum, meaning that for almost all places, the Brouwer class will split. And that's actually a really fun exercise, which I'll, I'll, I'll say a word about in a second. All right. And now you can add these things together. And the co-kernel, it turns out, is this map where you add these, these elements of Q mod Z or Z mod 2, which you can think of as uh, you know, the half integers mod Z, to this map to Q mod Z just by summing. And this map is surjective. OK, so there's a fairly explicit description of the Brouwer group of Q and, in fact, of any number field. Are there any questions about this? And this is highly non-trivial, this stuff. So, so maybe a, a fun exercise is to use the uh, Severi Brower interpretation to show uh, that if alpha is in Brower of Q, alpha restricted to Q nu, so, so the completion of Q is zero for almost all nu. Okay, and this is a, this is a really fun exercise. You should, you should do it, it's, it's great. All right, um, are there any questions about that before I move on? I guess I have 10 minutes left. Where, where exactly do you need to use class field theory here? I mean, I guess you need it for the injectivity of the, the line this, arrow? This is part of the statement of, of class field theory, I would say. Oh, hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's like it shows up when you do the proof. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you the Brouwer group of a number field. Sure, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, it, do, it doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't follow from class field theory, except insofar as it's like literally part, part of the statements. It's like when you, if you go through Kessel's for like, like a, a huge amount of it is working out Brouwer groups. Yeah, one way to say it is that class field theory is, um, so, so you can think of this, this isomorphism as being a, a certain element in, in H2 of, of a local field. And the the reciprocity map is cupping with that element. So so like this isomorphism literally is the the key. Um, okay, sure. If you do the cohomological approach. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, 
Cool. Any other questions? Any anyone want to see more examples? Can you can you um, is it possible to describe the multiplication in the group um, in terms of you know like twisted forms of objective mm -hmm. space? Yeah. So let's do that. So so um so we can do Asimov algebras first. Maybe that's easier. So suppose um so let's let's interpret multiplication. Um, so suppose A1 and A2 are as my algebras. Representing some classes alpha one and alpha two, then alpha one tensor alpha two is an azimuth algebra representing uh, alpha one times alpha two. All right, so it's not totally obvious that this is an azimuth algebra. Can anyone tell me why it is? So remember, uh, as my algebra it was a twisted form of a matrix algebra. Yes, because if you tensor two matrix algebras and you get a matrix algebra. Yeah, exactly. So being in as my algebra is a local property, so you can just pass to the pass to a cover where where your thing is literally a matrix algebra, and then this is just a fact about matrix algebras. All right. So so let me think. So how do we? Yeah, so so it's not totally obvious to me how to how to do this in terms of Severi Browers. So the 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 easiest way to say it is now suppose that uh, P one, which is the projectivization of some twisted sheaf E, and P two is the projectivization of some twisted some twisted vector bundle E prime, are Severi Browers representing alpha one and alpha two. So here this is uh, alpha one twisted vector bundle. And this is a alpha two twisted vector bundle. Um, and uh, then, um, then I guess uh, the projectivization of their tensor product uh, represents alpha one, alpha two. Um, let's think if we can find it. I guess what you can do if you want to do this geometrically, uh, and maybe I'll just say it verbally because since writing it out carefully would be a little bit complicated. Um, so, so um, Severi Browers come with a, a natural embedding in projective space, um, given by uh, given by um, the the anti-canonical line bundle. And I think what you can do is you can take the Segre embedding of the of the product. And then take it span, and I think that will. Uh, is that quite right? That's not quite right. So what you need to do is take the take some intersection of quadrics cut out by the, that 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 contains in it. But I, I would need to think a little bit to get it exactly right. So maybe let me not try to do it right now. Yeah. So I think there is a geometric way you could write down the space in terms of the anti-canonical embeddings of the Severi Browers, but but I, I don't want to attempt it um, in the next six minutes. Is that okay, Arvin? Yeah, I'm happy. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this I think this is the maybe the, the the easiest way to think about it. One one question, by the way, and this is something Kalara I know has been thinking about recently, is uh, it's not so easy to write down equations for Severi Browers. So so it's kind of closely related to, to writing down equations for the anti-canonical embeddings of projective space, and it, that's just not not a totally trivial thing to do. So um, so yeah, I think we can write down equations for uh, Severi Brower curves, so conics. That's that's pretty easy. But I think above that, even even Severi Brower surfaces, like it's, I think Kalar managed to write down like birational models in in some generality. But I don't think we know how to do much with threefolds. Yeah, so it's a, it's a, this is a really interesting area to try to make explicit. All right, any other questions? All right, um, let me. I only have five. Oh, uh, Sasha, did you have a question? I yeah, one one quick question. So, so uh, two torsion elements in the Brower group give you, uh, I guess, quaternion algebras. Do you know much about the, kind of the higher that's torsion? Cool. 
That's huh? that's true in field. It's not true in general. Oh well, yeah, over, over a field. But sure, over, over a field. So two torsion gives you quaternion algebras. But do we know about higher torsion in general? What those yeah, are? so it's really yeah. So there's a there's a kind of big open question, called which is broadly speaking called the period index question. Which is and let me give you a, you a loose formulation. So so given alpha in the Brouwer group of X, and people mostly think about this when X is a, a spec of a field, can you find, so maybe what, what, what is the minimum rank? Rank or, or GCD of the ranks, et cetera, of an alpha twisted vector bundle. Or for example, what is the minimum rank of a, of a Azumai algebra representing alpha? So that's that's the square of the minimum rank of a alpha twisted vector bundle. And that's it's a really hard question. So so for for two torsion over a field, it's it's we can do it. It's it's easy. It's always you can always find a, a something of, of size two. But in general, um, it's this is a really hard question. And and people we know of examples uh, where. Um, in general, it's if you have a, a alpha twisted vector bundle of rank n, alpha is n torsion, but the converse is definitely not true. Yeah, so so again, asking for explicit representatives of these things, meaning especially like kind of small representatives, is like a really hard open question. Does that answer your question, Sasha? Yeah, cool. All right. I think I think we're basically out of time, unfortunately. Um, so so maybe let me kind of briefly say what we're going to do next time. So next time is we'll use the theory we've developed today to understand HI of a field with coefficients in GM. So in particular, uh, the the main theorem we're going to try to prove is uh, if so. Suppose um, one so K of C is the function field of a curve. A curve over an algebraically closed field, then H2 of K of C with coefficients in GM, so in particular the Brouwer group, will be zero. And then we're also going to show, so suppose Kx bar is a strictly Henselian DVR, so, so if we have time, we'll show that H2 of Kx bar also. Uh, with coefficients in GM is zero. Okay, and this will be the key ingredient to finish computing the etal homology of curves, which we'll hopefully do next time. All right, so we're out of time, so let me stop recording. I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone has any questions.